what it talents, what it talents, what it do. God in uncertainty. Trust in God in uncertainty. During our anniversary in April, our apostles came and delivered a powerful word. Apostles Tony talked about how the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And we think he comes to do all three things at once. But sometimes he comes to do them separately. Sometimes a thing that happened in your life was not to kill you, but it was to steal something from you. Sometimes it wasn't to steal something, but it was to destroy something in your life. And whenever the enemy comes, you have to take a moment and pause and see what God wants you to recover. Because he said you can recover all. And in this time, Apostle Tony talked about how we have made it through the pandemic. Of course, we're still feeling the aftershocks and the after effects, but we all have breath in our body. God has been good. We're here to tell the testimony about it. But even though he didn't kill us, he stole something from us during this time. And whenever God comes to reveal, he comes to heal. And the thing that was revealed was that during this time, the enemy stole our trust in God. That where we might have had a, a trust that God is going to show up and do the miraculous and we're looking for miracles and signs and wonders and God we know you can do it now we've been dumbed all the way down to just surviving I'm just grateful I survived but God came that you might have life and life more abundantly the price that Jesus paid was too big for you to live a life of just survival. The price he paid was for you to live, to have life and have life more abundantly. But that can only happen when you have trust in God. But life be life in. And I know that firsthand. And there are some uncertainties in life where what God told you is not what you see. Where what God promised you is not the place that you're standing in right now. Will you trust him in the uncertainties? We're going to go to Psalm 34, verses 1 through 10. We're going to do it in the King James Version. We're going to get real deep this morning. Hallelujah. Verse 1. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. And let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me. And he delivered me from all my fears. They looked unto him and were lightened and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. Oh, fear the Lord, ye his saints, for there is no want to them that fear him. 
The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. Woo! I'm telling you, all those verses can preach all by themselves. And it's funny that when you read them, you, you realize that they are standalone verses. They don't really flow together. They're individual statements. You know what was so amazing about David? I mean, David was a bad brother. He can hold a sword in one hand and a harp in another. One woman doesn't want that. A man that can kill you and sing you love songs. Look at God. Balance, balance. <laughs> but <laughs> every verse was written after an alphabet in the Hebrew. It's translated to English, so we don't get that, but it's going down the A, B, C, D, and that's why it is written disjointly, but it's written as a beautiful poem. That's why you can have in the beginning when it says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. And then you have the verse in 6 that said, this poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. And you're wondering, well, how can his praise be continually be in my mouth, but yet I still be poor and in fear and crying for God out of all my troubles that's because there are uncertainties in life. There are fragments. We're made up of fragments. You know, it's funny. They say that nothing that has perfect seams is authentic. You can tell something is authentic and natural because of the inconsistencies. When we were building our house, we went to the design center, and if you ever been to the design center, you know that is candy land. I mean, picking all of the different things that you can customize and put in your house. Next thing you know, your house has gone up a whole nother price range because you picked all these upgrades. But when we were looking at our countertops, they showed us the different types of stone that you can do. And if you do marble, it's beautiful. But the hard thing is matching up the seams because it's inconsistent. It is a natural stone. It also requires a lot more work if you get marble because it stains easier, it scratches easier. How many of you know I have a little boy? So we did quartz, which is not a natural stone. It's the look of. Some of us are walking around with the look of and not the authentic thing because it's easier to carry off a look than to be a thing. See, it's easy to look like you have integrity, but it's the difference between really walking that integrity out when it's hard and no one's looking and you have to answer to God. See, it's easy looking like, hey, I live a life of consecration to God, but it's hard behind the scenes when your flesh is acting crazy and you have to put that thing under subjection and really live that thing out. Are you the real thing? But the beauty of the real thing is that there are fragments. How many of you have ever seen like a quilt? A quilt is made by putting together different pieces of material. Some of us have family quilts, which are made of maybe different people's bridal gowns or christening gowns and different things that have meaning. And all these fragments are sewn together, and it makes a beautiful final product. But how many of you know that when you turn the quilt on the backside, there is a solid piece of fabric holding it all together? There is a solid foundation that ties that thing all together. See, you may be the fragmented thing, but when you allow God to be the solid piece that holds you all together, those things which may look like an inconsistency and a fragment and will ordinarily fall apart becomes a beautiful masterpiece that can be passed down from generation to generation to 
generation, all because you made sure your backing was secure. And so when we talk about trusting God, the first thing that we normally do is go into a praise. They say, do you trust God? Everybody starts praising God. But there is a difference between praise and trust. Praise is an action. Trust is a state of being. Praise is about doing. And see, life can jerk you around real quick. It can take you from praise to prayer in an instant. You're praising God in one moment and you're on your face in the next. And you can praise God and not trust him. You can run around this church until your legs fall off and walk out of here and still be full of so much worry, so much doubt, so much unbelief. Because there is a difference between trust and praise. You don't know how much you trust God until things are going wrong in your life. You don't learn that you trust God when you get the promotion, you learn that you trust him when you're about to get laid off. You don't trust him in the engagement. You trust him when you're about to be divorced. You don't learn how much you trust God when you have everything. You learn your trust in him when you're about to lose everything you have. See, trust is proven when things in life don't go as planned. Are you able to trust him in sorrow? Are you able to trust him in grief? Are you able to trust him when they find that lump in your breast? Are you able to trust him when they say your kids are going to be a statistic? Are you able to trust him when they say your father is dying of cancer? Are you able to trust him when life throws you uncertainties? Can you still say, I trust in God? And see, the reason why it's hard for us to trust is because we live in a society where we're connected to so many people. We have followers. We have social media outlets that create a false sense of community, but there's no intimacy. And the only way you can develop trust with a person is through intimacy with them. It means you have to know who that person is. You say, well, how can I develop trust in God? One of the things for me that helps is reading my word every day. Finding out who he is. Who is the person that I'm praising? Who is the person that I'm talking about? Who is the person that I'm saying I want to give my all to, my everything to? Who is he? You don't know who he is if you don't pick up your word and read it and find out about what the God is on the inside of you. How much he loves you, how much he cares for you, how much he wants to show up for you, how his word never fails. And then you begin to have experiences with God. And you may be new to this thing and say, hey, I don't have any experience with God yet. The fact that you woke up this morning is proof that you can trust God, that he is true to his word, that he said you have a plan and a purpose in this earth. So I woke you up this morning. Because if there was no need for you to be here, you would not have the breath of God in your body. And you start there. And you develop consistencies with God where you can look back and say, wow, God brought me out of this situation and God was there with me through that. That's why when you read the Bible, they're always referencing the God of Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac, because each one of them had different experiences with God that was passed down from generation to generation that the children of Israel can stand on and say, I know that God is God. He is the God that said, I am that I am from
from a burning bush. He is the God that was a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. He is the God that split the Red Sea and made us come over on dry land. He is the God that provided manna from heaven when we had nothing to eat. And when we got tired of that, he provided quail. He is the God when there was nothing to drink. Moses was able to take a step, hit a rock, and water was able to come out. He is a God that will never leave me, never forsake me, never leave me hanging. That's why it's so important that we live this thing out so that our children have experiences that they can stand on. I know that God is a healer because when my daddy was dying from cancer, I saw him every day in his word, saturating himself, speaking out healing scriptures, and I saw cancer leave his body. I know that God is a deliverer from depression because I remember when my mom was on maternity leave and she shut out everything. It was in her word and how the atmosphere in the house changed. I know God is a provider because when they had to cut their income in half, it was almost $2,000 in the hole every month. We never went hungry. We stayed in private schools. We still had clothes on our back. We didn't notice a difference because they still sowed. They still tithed. They still gave. When they didn't have a college fund set up for us, See God show up supernaturally because God said we would never have to pay for our education because what soldier goes to war at their own expense and seeing God show up so that me and my brother never had to take out a student loan. Money wasn't sitting in the bank. That was a month-to-month faith fight where they were able to pay out tuition. I know that I can stand because when year after year the enemy tries to throw us out this building, shut the church down, say nobody wants to hear it, they're not even coming, it doesn't even matter, and see my parents stand on the front line and say, I know that I know what God called me to do. Come hell or high water, I'm going to do this thing. See, I can stand on a legacy of faith. What legacy are you building from? See, I can say I know the God of Tyrone and Cynthia Marshall. And because I know their God, he's become mine. I know the God that when it looked like I was going to die giving birth, how such a peace showed up in that hospital room that I experienced no fear. Then I knew that I knew that I shall live and not die and declare the works of the Lord. And how even when they couldn't find my veins to give me an IV and they were so scared that they weren't able to give me the numbing medicine and I was going to feel everything. That they thought I was going to stroke out on the table and bleed out and they were scared to even cut me open. How God showed up in that room. See, I know that he is a God that can deliver you from your valley. Because when my baby had to be in the NICU for 90 days and I was going through postpartum and I was so depressed and I felt like I had failed as a mother and I had failed as a woman of faith because I thought that me and my baby was going to walk out of the hospital together. It didn't look like I thought it was going to, but I saw that God is still faithful and what he promised he will bring to pass. How he was with me on the bathroom floor telling me how much he loved me, how much I was calling chosen for a time such as this how he was with me when I found out that my marriage was falling apart and at the same time God had called me to step into ministry like never before and I felt so unqualified God my heart is broken God I feel like I'm pleading how can I help anybody else and God said give me your pain and I promise to show you your purpose see I know he is a keeper that when I went through a 
divorce and I went through a deep depression and developed social anxiety and didn't know if I would ever speak again. How God told me that if he called me before, his calling never changed on my life. I know he's a provider that after the dust settles and you start looking at that budget, now you're a single income and you weren't the breadwinner, but you know that God told you your standard of living would not change and you'll see God show up month after month and provide for you and your family. No, life is not always certain, even when you know you're in the path of God, but will you trust him? Will you trust him? Woo, this time, hallelujah. We're going to wrap this up in a nice pretty bow. This scripture, Psalm 34, was birthed out of a situation that happened in 1 Samuel. David was on the run. He was on the run from Saul, a man who he loved a man who he would fight for. And now he can no longer stay in Israel because Saul is trying to kill him. David was the one who would play the harp for him because Saul struggled with extreme depression and historians believe it might have been bipolar depression. He would have extreme outbursts and nobody can sue them. But don't tell me there's not power in worship. Because when he was having his manic outbreaks, David would come and play the harp. And the presence of God would fill the place. And Saul would go to sleep. I'm telling you, if there's hell breaking out in your household, you put on that worship music. You open up your mouth and begin to sing. Because when you praise and worship God, you summons all of who he is in your environment. David did that for him, and yet he still hated him. It was a time he was singing, and Saul took up a spear, threw it at him, just narrowly missed him. Because no weapon that's formed against you will prosper, and it'll pass through God's hand before it ever reaches your feet. And so he said, I'm on the run. I have nowhere else to go because David was also a warrior. He had ransacked everywhere, destroyed, plummaged, and did damage. And he found himself in a place where he said, the only place I can go is to the land of the Philistines. And he had to go to a place called Gath. And some of you may know where Gath is or who came from Gath. But the very first giant ever, David ever faced named Goliath came out of Gath. See, sometimes the betrayal of your loved ones will force you into the enemy's camp. And David now had to go hide out in the very place where he had slain their victor. But remember, God gave him a promise. At this time, he knew that he was supposed to be king. He knew that he was called, and yet here he is on the run for his life with no way of knowing if this was going to work out. If you go to 1 Samuel 21, verse 12. It says, and David laid up these words in his heart and was so afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. And he changed his behavior before them and feigned himself mad in their hands and scrabbled on the doors of the gate and let spittle fall down on his beard. This man pretended to be absolutely insane. <laughs> absolutely insane. Insane. He went to Gath hiding out, but when he got there, they recognized him immediately. 
Because how many of you know when you've had a true encounter with God, it doesn't matter where you try to run and hide. They will see you because there is a difference on your life. You may think you're going to backslide if you want to, but when you've truly been marked by God, they will look at you and say, you do not belong here. I don't even know what you're doing this in this environment. We see there's something different about you. So they caught him. And David said, uh-oh, we got to go to plan B. We're acting absolutely insane. And it worked. The king was like, you're bringing this man before me. He is a madman. Get him away from here. And he was able to live in the place of the Philistines. They talked about how there were three different encounters where David could have killed Saul. And he didn't. There was a time when Saul was using the bathroom and David stole his water bottle or something. It was like, hey, I was this close to you. I could have killed you. But I want you to know how much I love you and I honor you. See, you think that you always have to fight every battle. But God is saying the battle is not yours. It belongs to me. In the same way you fought every battle, I'm telling you it's not the same way you're going to win this one. Let me tell you how good God is. David didn't even have to kill Saul. Saul fell on his own sword and was destroyed. See, you're thinking that you have to go and you have to guard up and you have to fight and you have to defend yourself. And God said, baby, I want you to know that I got your back. It doesn't matter what's happening. It doesn't matter what's around you. I go before you. I go behind you. I go around you. You can trust me. So your praise sounds differently when you know God's got your back. David went through seven years of uncertainty before he was crowned king. And even when he was in this calling that God put on his life, there were several things that happened that looked like they were going to destroy him. But God was still God in his life because he was a man who could trust God. Can you trust God in your uncertainty? Can you trust God to know that this battle is not yours? It's the Lord's. That God has your back. That I know it doesn't feel like it's going to turn around for you. That I know you may be in a place where you may be in death and you may feel like you're going completely mad. And God said, no, the call of king is still on your life. I need you to trust me. Because trust in these seasons builds experiences with God. This is not going to be your biggest giant. This is not going to be your biggest battle. I wish I could tell you something else, but as you live life, you know that giants do come, but they fall. And you wouldn't be standing face to face with any giant in your life if God did not already equip you to be a giant slayer. He's saying, will you trust me in this uncertain season? Will you allow me to build character? See, we want to cry out to God and see him immediately come, immediately answer our prayers, immediately deliver. God is not a genie and a bottle. He is a good, good father. And any good parent knows that you have to develop character in your child in order for them to survive. Trusting God in uncertainties is developing character in you so that your pain can be used for his purpose. So that you'll be able to pass down your own legacy of faith to the generations under you. I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet. telling you every time you call on God he answers 
There was a story where Daniel was praying. And they were believing God for some very serious things that were happening in the region. And he said, we're going to go on a fast. And they begin to fast. And when the angel of God showed up, he said, the moment you opened your mouth and prayed, we were on the move and on assignment to you. But we had to fight through the principalities. And see what happens is sometimes when God doesn't show up immediately, our trust in him wavers. And we stop going after him the way that we need to. We stop chasing after him the way that we need to. See, I'm telling you, there are some valleys that you get in that when you're in a battle, being quiet is your enemy. That is a time where you need to cry out to God. That is a time where you need to be on your face. That's a time where you need to fast and say, God, what is it that you want me to do? Because you recognize I am a soldier in the army of the Lord. If I die, let me die in the army. But God, I'm going to be in your presence. Oh, God. If you're here today and you feel like you're in an uncertain place, and you just want some extra faith added with yours. Some extra agreement to keep you on your journey, letting you know that God will not leave you. God will not forsake you. That you're not in this battle by yourself. I'm going to ask you to come forward. God doesn't want to leave you here by yourself. The battle is not yours. The battle is not yours. God is saying whatever way you already had in your mind that you were going to win it, it is not yours. It belongs to me. Lay it at my feet at this altar. Whatever plan you had, God said, let me show myself strong. Let me show you that I'm God. You don't have to pick up a sword for this one. I'm already God. I'm already defeated it. I've already delivered you from it. I just need you to trust me. Oh, Jesus. Just begin to lift up your voice. I'm telling you, when you're in a battle, it's not the time to be quiet. When you're in a battle, it's the time to open up your mouth and cry out to God. He is the deliverer of those that call on his name. Blessed be the Lord, oh my soul, and all that's within me. We praise your holy name, God. God, there's none like you. God, we exalt you. God, we lift your name up. God, we declare you are strong, you are mighty. God, you are the same God. Woo! Oh, God. I'm going to lay hands on you. This is not going to be a tarrying situation because God has already done the work. But your expectation will not be cut off. So whatever it is you come on this altar expecting God to do, expect it to show up for you right now in this moment. If it's peace you need, receive the peace. If it's strength you need, receive the strength. If it's a sound mind, receive it. Glory to God. Well, listen, we're at that point of service where we don't want to leave. Some of you may have been hearing about the goodness of God, but you don't know this God that we're speaking about. Maybe you're streaming in and you have never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I want you to bow your head and close your eyes. We want to make sure that heaven is your home. Amen. Hallelujah. 
glory to God, you can repeat after me. Say, Lord, I come to you just as I am. You know my life and how I've lived. Forgive me, Lord. I repent of my sins. I believe Jesus died on the cross for me and rose again. I give you my life. I want Jesus Christ to come into my life and come into my heart. I make you Lord and Savior. Hallelujah. Well, if you prayed that prayer, we believe that you are saved. We want you to text hashtag BCMIDC to 22300. We just want to meet you, greet you. We want to pray with you. We want to connect with you and just explain a little bit further the decision that you made on today.